watching Tag TV. I don't have no words to express what each one of you would be feeling here. But I don't know if, if saying that only Kashmiri Pandits suffered was right or not. Some suffered the loss of their homelands. Some suffered the homes that turned graveyards for them, who never left Kashmir. Who suffered more is a question that we all need to answer. Some have been waiting to go back home for 30 years. And some grew up in that hostility, in that terrorism for 30 years. Who is more suffering? Who's, whose pain is more? These questions, it's the time that we stop and think, who is suffering more? Is it us? Is it we? Or what, what has changed in these 30 years? Let's take time to reflect back on those times and see what we have gathered in these 30 years. Is it hatred? Is it love? Or is it beyond that, that we all have to see what is happening? They're shouting, there have been months of lockdown in Kashmir. We shout, there have been 30 years of exile for us. They shout, our internets don't work. We say nobody spoke for us. They say it is human rights. We say the world remained silent. And all in all between all this, what was lost was home for someone, was childhood for a lot of many people, was the roots to the next generation who never could realize and understand what Kashmir was for them. Today is the day, ladies and gentlemen, that we have come a long way since that deadly, deadly night of 19th January. I'm sure many of you sitting here would have been there when that all things, those all things happened. I have vivid memories only of that day and nothing beyond that for six, first six, seven years of my life that I spent in Kashmir. I wish I had better memories, but no, I don't. I wish I had better things to talk to my children when I talk to them about what I owned there, but I'm sorry, I don't. Today, ladies and gentlemen, let us take a moment of silence and think and introspect within ourselves of what we actually want. Is it the identity that was lost 30 years back? Or is it the fight for the home? Is it the fight for the land? Is it the fight for the culture? What is that we are trying to save and what is that we're trying to preserve for the future generations? Do we want them to know what Kashmir was as it is today? Or do we want them to know what it was back 700 years probably when the real oppression starts? 70 years of oppression for people who are there now and 700 years for them. I don't say they are wrong or I don't say I am wrong. I am right for what I say. They, are, they, they may be right for what they say. But the point is that we have to ponder, we have to reflect back and reach a point wherein we can say that that land belonged to me. And today, ladies and gentlemen, after 30 years of that exodus, half my age gone in various lands, but which I never could call my home, we are standing here today to discuss about what impact and what is the future forward. With this thought, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome each one of you and I thank each one of you that you could make, irrespective of the weather outside, you could make it here. A huge round of applause and a big, big, big thank you for each one of you present here, ladies and gentlemen. May I request Acharya Zenji, who is present amongst us, to please say a prayer for all the people who lost their lives, who lost their homeland, who lost their motherland, who lost their culture, and who lost their roots in all these 30 years. Acharya Ji. Namaste, bhaiyo, behano, my dear friends. We're here at a very solemn, it's a very solemn event, as you all know. I'm just going to start off with a simple prayer. One of Kashmir's greatest gifts to world civilization was an incredible, peerless scholar called Kumarajiva. And Kumarajiva's translation of the Lotus Sutra is considered to be one of the most important documents that has influenced world civilization. This particular sutra was extremely popular and revered in Nalanda, which needs no introduction. The people in Nalanda, the greatest sages in history, they all met with one of the worst holocausts in, on, on, in, 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 in the human experience and in the human imagination. And I think by just chanting the mantra of the Lotus Sutra in Sanskrit, 
And I'll give you the English translation. We can somehow send great empathy, great compassion to all, suffer, all beings who are suffering, particularly our brothers and sisters in Kashmir. I'll just say a few words for you all. Yamivaham lokapita svayambhu chikitshaka sarrapa jannanata. The Lord Buddha says, I am the self created one, the heavenly father of all beings, the Lord of all creation. Tridhatukam komam idam parigraho ye hyatra dhayanti mamaiti putra. Which means this threefold world is my domain, and all those who are suffering are my children. These Kashmiri Hindus. Who are suffering are the children of the Lord Buddha. All of us are his children. We're all a family, which as you know, they say Vasudaiva Kutumbakum. So therefore, in this particular context, I pray to we call uh, I'm just going to chant a quick prayer to bring the light of the eternal Buddha Amitava in all um, in all ten directions. So wherever people are lost and alone and scared and staggering in the darkness of hate, they will find the light of compassion, the light of hope, and the light of a satsang, which is what we represent here today. Namo Amitava Buddhaya Amota Sadata Amideva Hari Om Amrita Dejavati Swaha Namo Arya Valokideshwara Swaha Muni Muni Mahamuni Shakyamunaya Swaha May I request our president, Mr. Utpalama, who is the president of Kashmiri Overseas, Overseas Association of Canada, to share his thoughts on this very important day. Now. Since 30 years, we were hounded up like cattle and chased out from the valley, the same place that for times immemorial has been our own place. We were chased out in the night with ladies, kids, crying, but nobody taking a note of that even until now. But we see a ray of light somewhere with eminent personalities like Rajiv ji, Tahir ji here, who can at least present to the world that what we as a community has suffered. We see it as a ray of light with the change of governments in India whereby at least Kashmiri community has been recognized as somebody who was displaced. We see a ray of light elsewhere in the world as well that we as a Kashmiri community are being recognized that they have suffered and enough is enough. Abrogation of Article 370 was a landmark for the Kashmiri community and believe me, we're all waiting for it to take place in real sense so that all of us, we Kashmiri community can go back. It's 30 years, 30 years now, that we're still talking about going back to our own place where we grew up as kids, we roamed around, we had orchards, we had land, we had freedom that was taken away from us by the perpetrators who basically took up the guns and a very minuscule community who was busy with their own schedules. We had nothing to do with terrorism, we had nothing to do with violence, and here we are all across the world talking to the world and telling them that enough is enough, please take note of it and we need to go back. Thank you for being here and please spread this all around the world, the narrative has to change now. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put together our hands for all our sponsors for uh, the day. Uh, Shri Virendra Sumbli ji, Indo-Canadian Hindu Forum, Ekal Foundation, Kashmiri Overseas Association of Canada, 
Shri Rakesh Kaul, Crown Group of Hotels, and Shri Kuldeep Sharma Ji, Shri Vinod Munshi Ji, Shri Arun Taplu Ji, Shri Kamal Raina Ji, Shri Nasir Mehdi Ji, India Sajabat and Pooja Hut, Tag TV, Z TV, PTC Punjabi, Global Kashmiri Pandit Diaspora, Baloch Human Rights Council, Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, and Weekly Voice Newspaper. Without... Thank you. Namaste, Canada. I was told, I was warned that this is a very, uh, you know, big snowstorm coming and do you really want to come and all that kind of stuff. And I'm so delighted I came. No snowstorm would stop me from this important event that we are all celebrating. Not only for Kashmiris, but for all Indians, for all Hindus and all civilized human beings, no matter what their identity. The awareness of this Kashmir Holocaust is nothing compared to so many other events, so many other genocides that we are aware of. I've been to the various Holocaust museums, genocide museums in Washington, in London, various events, and I must say I have not heard of the Kashmir genocide being mentioned. And when you raise it, people wonder what you're talking about. Is it that serious? Is it a big deal? This sort of thing. It's not in textbooks. And guess what? It's not in Indian textbooks either, which is quite a disgrace. I've been to conferences on genocide studies with not a single paper on this topic. Genocide studies by all the liberal people and all the human rights people and I don't see it mentioned. This is quite a, quite a disgrace. It's a pan-Indian issue for sure that all Indians should think about and do their, do their bit to promote this. <clears throat> about 30 years ago, I was invited to a book launch in Princeton University. They were giving some award for the best book on Islamophobia. So I wanted to know what is this? And they told me, oh, don't you know, Islamophobia is, you know, those people who don't like Islam and are against it and so on. So I went for this event and, and it was certainly very well attended. A lot of big shots there, really uh, upset that there is Islamophobia in the world. And I had been fighting prejudice against Hindu Hinduism in the United States in the academy, in the media, my foundation funded a whole lot of projects on uh, bias in uh, TV, in uh, New York Times, Washington Post. We have reports we did in the 1990s on these kind of topics. So I was in it for a long time and also the school textbooks. And so I thought maybe there ought to be a term Hindu phobia. And, I went, and somebody had told me when I said, I don't know what is this Islamophobia, he said, just go and search and you know, you ought to know. And sure enough, there were a few million hits, but there was no term Hindu phobia. So we decided we'll coin the term Hindu phobia. And we, I started writing on this. And I remember in the early days being attacked by Hindus that, look, you are kind of embarrassing us. You are embarrassing us. Because, you know, you come and you start talking about these things. We want to talk about, you know, we are doing IT and we are doing great. We are the great democracy and all that. And you are saying we are facing Hindu phobia. So there is a shame that the victim feels. This is, this is the psychologists know this. Uh, rape victims don't want to go and file a case because they are ashamed of what happened. I think there is a similar shame that might have prevented the Kashmiris from raising hell. They really ought to be raising hell about this. And it's better late than never that this is becoming an international issue. This should be in the newspapers, this should be in the media, this should be in the textbooks, there should be resolutions. You know, there should be resolutions in, in, uh, the, in the US Congress, in, there should be resolutions in the Canadian Parliament to, uh, to recognize this as, a, as an important day. And, and it's not enough for once in a while we meet and we talk about it. We should actually make it into a cause that we are going to have a official recognition of the Kashmir Genocide Day in various governments in the world. Thank you. We have a number of 
member of parliament. Maybe he should raise this in the parliament. Yes, yes, I'm sure. Sure. Now, my mother, who's 94 in Delhi, when I told her that I'm coming here, she was so happy. And, and she, when I told her what the cause is, and she wanted me to remi remind all of you that we, the Punjabis, face something similar also. In, in uh, 47, when we had partition, my father had to run away from Lahore. We had lived there for generations, very well settled. It was home, it is home, taken away. You know, two thirds of Punjab went to Pakistan and the very fertile. So it is, Punjab means five rivers and now there's only three Ab left, two of them gone. And even the three that are left, the Indus Water Treaty says the water will go to Punjab or to Pakistan, much of the water, which is kind of a shame. So the, my father had to run away and uh, many of the family members, many of the extended family friends, they did not make it. So it was a very horrible, so we understand, uh, the Punjabis understand the importance of this. I've started, I started thinking about what are the causes, what are the lessons we can learn from events like, from uh, events like what the Kashmiris faced and what the Punjabis faced. And there is a, of course there are some differences. In the case of Punjab, because the geography is flat land, you cannot run and hide in the mountains. You cannot go into a cave and sort of hide there th that they won't find us. Because you are out there in the open, they are out they're here to kill you. They are on horses, you can't outrun the horses. So, Either you're going to be killed or you fight back. So the Punjabi was okay, we got to fight back. That was a Kshatriyata. The fighter spirit was there, definitely in the, in the Punjabis. And therefore, it took, uh, it was a buffer, Punjab was a buffer for the onslaught of uh, Islam to, it took a very long time after conquering Sindh, which was very early, to reach Delhi it took hundreds of years because they would just go on resisting, fighting back. And the, Islamic invaders would capture territory, then the Punjab armies would take it back. This went on for a very long time. It was not a, probably if you write the history of the Islamic expansion from, you know, the time they enter Punjab, which is the, uh, uh, the Pakistan, uh, border, Pakistan Punjab, till the time they enter Delhi, which is the other end of Punjab, the number of centuries, hundreds of years that it took is probably the slowest advancement of Islam anywhere, militarily. Uh, whenever, wherever it has gone militarily, it's been able to move very fast. So there is a certain Kshatriyas are there. Now, unfortunately what happened is, as Islam colonized, and by the way, we think of colonization under the British, but colonization started under the Muslims. So I, I'll say a lot of uh, politically incorrect things, but I have no problem defending these. Uh, Indian colonization started under the Muslims and then of course the British. So this Islamic colonization, uh, uh, you know, like all colonization, people start accommodating, people start assimilating, accepting, little bit, little bit, little bit comes in, each generation become a little more sort of accommodating of what's happening. So this <coughs> created a an attitude which was that, you know, if you are not being violently attacked, then, you know, it's okay. I mean, it could be worse. Life could be worse. So, we are lucky that today I am not being beaten up or something. I'm getting, I have my food and so on. So, kind of a minimalist lifestyle, I, I, as long as I am surviving, I have my do roti and dal, you know, maki roti saag aag mil gaya hai. So, I am okay. This sort of an attitude. And that's really not right. You have to this is your land, these people are some alien people, not only, we, I'm not concerned about their religion, whatever it is, but they're from some other place and they have really no business here coming and telling us how to live our lives. It's really no business with this. So this Islamic, Islamic uh, uh, you know, colonization became a, became a, a serious problem <coughs> and somewhere along the way, the Kshatriya Tal was compromised. The Kshatriyas, for those of you who don't know, is the is not just military people, but political people who know hard power, people who assert hard power. That's the Kshatriyata. The Brahmins uh, are the keepers of the soft power, the knowledge, 
the poetry, the literature, soft power. We know soft power is very important. But soft power will not survive if you don't have hard power. Once you lose the hard power, then they'll come and take the soft power when they want. You can, this is what happened to the Kashmiri uh, Brahmins, that they lost the hard power. They accepted Muslim ruler over them, which means that the role of the Kshatriya was not a Hindu role anymore. The Kshatriyata was given to the Muslim. And as long as he's not beating us up and all, he's okay only. So there is something I heard uh, called the 50 year golden period in Kashmir in the 1300s. And the golden period is called golden period because the Muslim king at that time was not killing us, beating, raping and destroying temples. He was okay with us, unlike his father who was doing all those things. So in psychology, it's called the Stockholm syndrome. Stockholm syndrome means somebody kidnaps you and he beats you up and he's really horrible. But then he starts being a nice guy, gives you, a, you know, good food, talks to you. And so gradually he wins you over and you actually start falling in love with him. You admire him because compared to how it was, it's better. So the standard of expectation is very low. You know, as long, because this guy's father and the previous other Muslims were f much more horrible compared to him. So it's sort of like what happened during Akbar's time also. Uh, Akbar was considered like golden period. Now to me, Hindus can't say we are living in a golden period unless we are ruling ourselves, unless it is ours, our uh, adhikar, our authority, under our shastra, under our, our theories and our lifestyle, un unless we are run, running a society like that, as long as it's an oppressor who came from another Middle East country, conquered us and uh, ruling over us, no matter how nice he is, I would not call it a golden rule. I may say it's relatively better than uh, other options, but it's not a golden rule, a golden, uh, a golden period. So there, we, there, there was a equilibrium of Brahmins ruled by, governed by Muslim rulers. Muslim is in the role of the Kshatriya and the Brahmin in the role of, you know, I'll mind my business, not do anything that is troubling and uh, you know won't threaten you and then you look after me so this sort of uh, uh, you know who's the boss and who's sort of operating under the glass ceiling equilibrium now when you have the lesson learned is that once you have lost the kshatriyata it's a matter of time that your Brahm, the brahmins will also be wiped out and that is what happened that is what this whole exodus is about because you don't have your own people in charge so this is, this has happened in many parts of India. It's happened in many parts of the world and there are lessons to be learned. The document, the, the, the Shastra called Arth Shastra is the seminal text or one of the seminal texts on Kshatriyata, on political science, economic theory, statecraft, military craft. And you know, until early 20th century, there was no copy of Arth Shastra to be found in the Indian in India. No copy. The only reason, the way we knew it, such a thing exists, is that it was referenced in other places. Other shastras referred to the Arth Shastra, but where is this Arth Shastra? Nobody had a copy. And then in Mysore, a copy was found. A whole copy in Sanskrit was discovered only about 100 years ago. So you know, this means that for some reason, this doctrine was considered like dangerous for us to know. Because if you know Arth Shastra, you know about identity politics, you know about international relationships, you know about political thought, you, you, know, you know how to, how to challenge, how to debate, how to argue, how to talk back. And that's dangerous. So I don't, historians don't know why exactly Arth Shastra disappeared from India. But it's quite interesting, it's for that thousand year period, that there was no Arth Shastra being taught. Now you would think that Arth Shastra ought to be a very important part of text today. But even today, when they teach Hindu Dharma, they'll talk about Gita, they'll talk, which is very nice, very important. Uh, there, many, many texts are taught. But hardly any of the Hindu temples and uh, places where you, you, Hinduism is being taught, are they really teaching Arth Shastra because that is the text for Kshatriyas. So you have to revive the Arth Shastra and revive the whole Kshatriya Dharma. It's not just moksha dharma that we need to learn. 
but Kshatriya dharma also. The loss of Kshatriya dharma will lead to the loss of the rest of the dharma also. Because when you lose, when you lose hard power, you cannot continue with only soft power. That is a very important point. So now, what needs to be done, many levels, every region of India is a great civilization, all integrated together into the overall Bharatiya civilization. Each region should have to rediscover and write about its own history, what happened to it, including all the oppression rather than feeling embarrassed and ashamed. You know, there is no uh, history of partition from the Hindu point of view that has been discussed. My mother's generation tells me that when they, uh, they're after partition, they were told, Ki bat, don't talk, you know, like that. It's not good. You know, it's like sort of embarrassing to us. Like the speaker previously said, that it was, it was considered a bit of a humiliation that this is what happened to you. But everybody else is talking about any victimhood they can claim. I mean, Islamophobia is uh, all about claiming victimhood. But come on, I mean, this is more 50 some countries in the world are Islamic countries. Their, their land has been expanding. Uh, the population has been expanding. Uh, this, this is thousands of miles away from the point of origin in the Middle East. And this business that we are victims, okay, if there are some instances of victim against the Muslims and it's very wrong. There should be no religious group that is persecuted for their religion. It should be for particular individual acts that somebody does, but not because of their religion. So if, if, if this business of, uh, you know, claiming victimhood is so much in vogue and it, it works, it gets you mileage. Uh, it gets you, you know, special commemorative days and stamp, postage stamps and holidays and all, all kind of recognition, then Hindus have to claim Hindu phobia and talk about Hindu phobia in a very open way and we have to teach our children there is nothing embarrassing and odd. We are the victims, they are the ones who, the ones who are the oppressors are the ones who should feel embarrassed and not us. We should be talking like that. Unfortunately, what has happened is the other way around. In India, there is something called subaltern studies, which is brought in by the Marxists to teach the Indian communities that their problem is caused by the Vedic heritage. So, instead of us being the victims of all of this that has happened, we are being portrayed as the perpetrators. We are the guys causing all this problem for other people. And that is called subaltern studies. The word subaltern means people who don't have a voice. They don't have a voice in history. So the history was written without their point of view. And we the scholars are going to be their voice. We the scholars. That's sort of what subaltern history. But if you really think about it, we the Hindus are the subalterns because our view and our, rep our vision and our experience is not mentioned in history. It is not in the museums. If you go around all these museums where they talk about these things, our holocausts and our uh, you know, genocides are not included there. So in a sense, we are the subaltern people and we ought to speak up like that we are the victims. Now, it's, uh, the, the issue also takes us to ideology and discourse. By the time hate speech codified in a holy book or some discourse, by the time that hate speech turns into physical violence, it's too late. But unfortunately, while the security systems in the world are on alert and very good, getting better all the time to fight the physical violence, if you start arguing and deconstructing the intellectual discourse which leads to this physical violence, you would be called all kinds of things. You'd, it is very politically incorrect to say that. But the fact is, if you really want to get behind and anticipate, if you want to get behind the violence, anticipate what is being taught which is creating the violence, you have to go and examine the sacred text, religious text and look at it. In about uh, the late 90s, my foundation got a grant proposal from Cornell University 
uh, religious studies department that uh, they want to conduct a, a world, uh, you know, world religions conference and uh, the Dalai Lama will come and all the main leaders of various religions will come uh, and they will talk about uh, uh, the persecution of uh, religious communities. So I was asked to fund it. I said, okay, great, let's fund it. Let's sit down and develop a, a concept paper. So everyone's idea was to uh, talk about how they are the victims. Every, all these different religious groups had position papers on how they are victims. Some place they are victim here, there. So I said, but who, what about the perpetrators? So if you are the victim, he is the perpetrator. If he is the victim, that is the perpetrator. So part of your religion is the victim, but another part of your religion is also the perpetrator. So we should talk about when we are talking all of the religions getting together, they were going to issue a resolution that we are all kind of uh, nice guys and everybody hating us and all that. But actually they, they ought to also acknowledge that some of those religions are very aggressive. So uh, what I told this uh, uh, professor is that, look, you still have two years for this event to happen. So I want to fund something before the conference. I want you to pick a graduate student in religious studies from one from every major religion. And this group will get one year grant to look through the main holy text of each faith. And they will highlight all the hate speech against other people. So you can do it for my faith too. If, you, if there's any uh, hatred against non-Hindus in the Gita, you will highlight that. But whatever it says in the Old Testament, New Testament, Quran, you will highlight it. And then what we'll do is we'll make a list of uh, all the texts, verse number and all that, which is hate speech. And part of this resolution, which these religious leaders are going to pass, should say that for my, in my faith, whatever is highlighted in, the relig in my religious text, I will deactivate it. I will not teach that anymore. Professor Jane Mary Law, that was her name, I just recalled. He was the chair of religious studies at Cornell, was very impressed. She said, you know, this will make it interesting, unique conference. We'll actually take, it, take him to task. So she wrote me a nice message to that effect. I said, okay, great, so let's prepare the papers, we'll do the funding. Then I didn't hear anything from her. <laughs> so then I wonder what's going on. So I called and she's busy. So then I finally visited. I took the car and drove to Ithaca and asked her, I said, oh, Jane, what happened? She says, you know, I'm in real serious trouble. Oh, I sent your proposal. Only the Hindu said he'll agree with this. <laughs> the Jewish person, the Christian person and especially the Muslim person said, how dare you tell us what to deactivate in our text? How dare you tell us? Now these guys all want to meet and, to, and come up with a big resolution about religious violence. Huh? Oh, we, are, we, we are victim and all that. But if you tell him that this is what's in your text and this is what's in your text, I will do the same for my text also. Whatever you find which is hate speech towards non-Hindus, I will deactivate it. Okay. I didn't even say expunge it and delete it because I know that uh, uh, God told them never to do that. <laughs> but I only said the person has to merely pass in the resolution he has to say, I will not teach. And my people, I will tell them not to teach these things, which means they can remain, but we won't teach them. They are not willing to do that. So this is the hypocrisy of the interfaith movement. The whole interfaith movement has a hypocrisy. <laughs> And I'm particularly addressing certain people I won't name who love these interfaith meetings because it gives them some prestige and pride they can represent. And they keep getting invited because they will not say anything politically incorrect. It is all this, we love each other, 
everybody is one, we are all the same. So you, you say all these goody goody things because the sponsors who are guilty people who want to write checks and feel they are doing good, they will say, yeah, yeah, I am funding this and next year he will fund more. So you are, you are in business, this is your business funding. However, after passing this resolution that we are all brothers and same this and that, the point is the guy will go and give his speech on the Friday uh, seminar uh, thing or the Saturday or the Sunday in his, in his uh, faith and uh, there he will go and trash all these uh, infidels and kafirs and all these kind of people. So it is hypocrisy. I mean, if you feel, I mean, it's like uh, uh, we have this Diwali celebration in a friend's house in Princeton and every year they uh, so, some people singing things and one of the fav favorite songs is Ishwara Allah Tere Naam <laughs> which means Ishwar and Allah are all same you know so I told him that uh, if Ishwar is same as Allah then Allah should be same as Ishwar it has to be both, both ways so I said you know what we should do is go to a mosque any mosque and see if you can say <laughs> and all these uh, the, that you know Krishna is same as Jesus fa fashion nowadays and uh, Mary is like goddess only something like that. I told I made a challenge for 25 years I've been making this challenge that you find me any mainstream church in any metropolitan city in the United States where they are willing to have me install the deities Hindu deities in their church and I will find you a Hindu temple where we will install Jesus as a deity, Good, provided it is both ways. And I want, to, I want to properly install the Hindu deity, including Kali also. And they are very scared, Kali, oh. <laughs> there is no such quid pro quo. So if you are same, it doesn't mean I have to be like you, it also means that you should be like me. If we are same, if x equals y, then y equals x, you learned that in school. So this business of sameness is sort of this all confusion, muddled up, hypocrisy, all this kind of thing goes on. Now this could go, I could go on but I think we have important speakers and I will just close by saying that th we have to think of helping those Muslims who are truly liberal, truly interested in reformation because after all you know Christianity was also pretty much like that. The, the bishops had the police powers, they had fatwa type powers. These bishops at one time and in Europe the reformation took about 200 years of violence inside inside the Christian uh, countries between different camps and what not and this reformation was not some overnight job it took a very long time and lot of sacrifice and Islam is sort of like pre-reformation Christianity so it is at some point in time Islam has to be reformed and the only people who can do it are the Muslims themselves in their own best interest because they want all the goodies of the West, they want modernity, their kids want to live a certain lifestyle. You know, Islamic civilization is not able to and will not be able to produce this kind of R&D and free thinking unless they change their, you know. So the, in the interest of Muslims themselves, they have to have a reformation and we ought to work together with those who are of that kind of orientation and facilitate that. Uh, and therefore, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for uh, Muslims who are themselves suffering because when, when radical Islam comes, the first people they go after are the Muslims themselves. And I have coined a term Swadeshi Muslim, which means uh, those Muslims of India who say that this is my home, this is my homeland, my ancestors are from here, they are not Arabs or Iranians or Turkish people who came from somewhere else. Uh, my DNA, my culture, my, my, my forefathers were Hindus and I am proud of it. I practice Islam but I, I am proud of my ancestors also and I have nothing. Why should I be violent against them? You, if you admit who your parents are, your you tendency is not to go violent against them. That is human nature. It is only through the denial which is fake, which is uh, you know falsified kind of denial. Only if you can convince people to deny their ancestry, can you get them to be violent against those very cultures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Qatar, which is a country that is about twice the size of a Walmart parking lot, <laughs> in the Middle East, why would they even care? Like, can they even find the place on a map?
So, you know, where is this money coming from and why is it going into Kashmir? Well, there's a reason money goes into Kashmir. For some people, they actually care about Kashmir and that's why they're sending money there on one side or the other. But for many folks, Kashmir is not Kashmir. Kashmir is the launching pad from where you go into India. In other words, it's from Pakistan into Kashmir and then the next stop is Delhi. That's why they care. Kashmir itself, uh, they don't really care one way or the other. So, where is the money coming from? Is it coming in large amounts or small amounts? Well, small amounts is coming from all over the world from places like, I don't know, Mississauga, for instance, just down the road here. The Islamic Society of North America got busted by the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, for funding terrorism. Who were they funding? The Kashmir Relief Fund, which turns out really wasn't Kashmir Relief, it was Hizbul Mujahideen, and of course Hizbul Mujahideen at the end of the day is really Jama Islamiya. That's who they were funding. So that's a little bit of micro-funding that goes in there. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's not billions, but nonetheless it's significant. But there's also money coming in from Qatar. And again, I get back to this question, why would Qatar or Saudi Arabia care? So first thing we're going to do is just take a little step back and for a moment let's just forget about Kashmir and put it over there and let's look at the whole world. There is a global struggle right now going on for the soul of Islam and to be a bit incautious and to overgeneralize, Islam at the moment is kind of breaking into two large groups. There is one group who want to take Islam as a faith, as a religion, and they want to modernize it. They want to weld human rights onto it. They want to give women's rights. They want to make it a bit more humanist. And they want to weld this thing into a piece and push it into the future. So that's sort of this group over here. You don't hear a lot about them uh, because they don't have the ear of government. They don't have a lot of funding. Over here, however, you've got the other group, political Islam, the Islamists, as we call them. These are people who want to take Islam as a faith convert it into a political force where it is an all-encompassing political solution. They want to create caliphate as they dreamed they had in the past, and this is what they want the world to look like. And the ideology they're pushing forward is something that would have been very comfortable in Arabia in the year 650. It wouldn't be quite so comfortable in Toronto, <laughs> maybe, uh, in the year 2020, although it's getting more comfortable in Mississauga, but that's another story. <laughs> So, so what's happening here? Well, the reality is political Islam has the momentum. It has the ear of government. Your parliamentary secretary to your prime minister here in Canada is a dude by the name of Omar Elgabra, who believes in Sharia law for Ontario, because that's what he campaigned for. He said Hamas and Hezbollah are not terrorist groups. Um, yeah, and he got, re he got refused entry to America on security grounds. Uh, he claimed it was Islamophobia, but whatever. So this, this kind of problem has gone right through our society and it's gone through a lot of other societies. And it is a real issue. So what drives this is, is the ideology of political Islam so attractive that everybody's just jumping up and grabbing it? Or is there something else going on? Well, the answer is it's money, it's funding. Political Islam is growing around the world because there's billions of dollars paying for it to make it happen. It's being driven by a bunch of people who are very intelligent. They think very strategically, unlike leaders in the West who don't. Um, and it's growing rapidly, and now it's got control of social media, so it's just exploding. So who are these groups? Well, there's the Muslim Brotherhood, originally formed by Hassan al-Banna in Egypt in about 1928. Uh, and he has a neat little catchphrase, Islam is the solution. Doesn't matter what the problem is, Islam is the solution. Healthcare, Islam. School, Islam. Economy, Islam. Mosque, Islam. Islam is the solution. It is an all-encompassing way of life. For those of you from South Asia, which is 99% of the population, I'm the only one here that's not. Hi, Daniel. How are you? Good. Um, he's the 1%. Um, for, <laughs> that is Jam Islamiya, El Madudi. Uh, this dude from sort of the India-Pakistan area creates Jam Islamiya, and it is essentially the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. It's the exact same ideology with the exact same goals. So where does the money come from for this? Well, back in the 1950s and especially into the 60s and 70s, it was Saudi Arabia. 
The Saudis, uh, and in fact, if you think about it, Saudi Arabia is the only country in the world named after a family. It is literally Saudi Arabia. It's Arabia of the Saudi family. That family thought that they needed to show how you know, serious they were and whatever. They wanted to be world leaders, so they pumped billions of dollars into the World Association of Muslim Youth, into the Muslim Brotherhood, into the Wahhabist uh, faith, and they pumped this thing around the world, Toronto, Ottawa, Delhi, you name it, they pushed it everywhere. Now, after 9-11, something interesting happened to the Saudis. It's called blowback. You folks might call it karma. Um, when you push something out, sometimes it comes back. And the Saudis kind of went, wow, you know, we exported the revolution and the violence to Afghanistan, to Paris, to Canada, and now they've got something called Al-Qaeda in the Saudi Peninsula, or in the Arabian Peninsula. And they're not too happy, so there's actually a struggle in Saudi Arabia. They're walking away from a lot of this stuff, or they're trying. But there's the country of Qatar. Uh, there are about 300 and some odd thousand citizens that live there, about two million expats. Uh, as I mentioned, it's literally like, it's about the size of Prince Edward Island, just a bit bigger than Prince Edward Island. The only thing Qatar has going for it is it sits on the world's largest natural gas field. So you can take your pen, or you can take a sword like that, which I wouldn't, <laughs> drive it into the ground and you get natural gas. And they share that gas field with Iran. Uh, how's that for a cool neighbor? So, that's where a lot of the money is coming from now. The Altani family that run uh, Qatar decided they're going to out-Saudi the Sauds. And they are now pouring billions into Qatar charity, into e-charity, and they're pumping this money anywhere. And they want to show how they are the righteous leaders of the Islamist future. They want to show that they control the Muslim Brotherhood. They want to show that they're the folks in charge. And they look at the Saudis and they just kind of, pfft, peasants. They look down at Saudi wealth and go, number two, because Qatar is like the world's richest country. So that's where a lot of this money is coming from. That's where a lot of the ideology is coming from. Now, let's just again, we'll take Qatar and kind of put them over there for a minute, and then we'll get back to them. And you might have noticed in the news lately, there's this country called Iran is kind of occupying a, bit, a good bit of the news cycle. Um, let's see, they kind of blew up some ships in the Gulf a couple of months ago, uh, Emirati ships and a few others. They blew, tried to blow up some oil tankers. They dropped a couple of missiles on Saudi Arabia, uh, managed to destroy a fairly large oil refinery and distribution center. They shot down a couple of American drones, and then Iranian Al-Quds-backed militias in Iraq attacked the American embassy. And of course, an attacking an American embassy, if you happen to be Iranian, has a bit of history to it. Um, Jimmy Carter lost his presidency because he did not defend the Iranian embassy, or did not defend the American embassy in Iran, and that destroyed his, temp, uh, his presidency. So Donald Trump finally decided, after a series of provocations, enough was enough. Uh, some sources told him that Soleimani was flying from Damascus uh, down to Baghdad, and he said, he's done. So in Iran, according to the government there, the hero, the martyr, of the Iranian revolution is dead. A lot of other countries looked around and said, world's biggest terrorist is dead. Um, just for the record, here in Canada, the Al-Quds Force is a listed terrorist group. It was listed in 212, it was relisted in 218. So the official position of public safety of Canada is the head of the world's largest terrorist organization was just killed. They won't say that out loud because they don't like that, but that's the reality of the Canadian position. So what's kind of missed right now with this Iran thing is that people are not paying attention because Iran, Qatar, Turkey, Pakistan, and Malaysia are forming a new alliance. And the sort of story they're telling is, oh, we're the new anti-Islamophobia alliance. But what they really are is a new Islamist alliance. This is gonna be, to them, they want to form the backbone of a new Islamist alliance, which will be both Sunni and Shia. Uh, they're quite willing to work with each other when they can. They're happy to kill each other on other days, but they'll work together when they need to. And this is sort of part of what's going on. Now, Qatar's role in all of this is money. Uh, they literally have billions of dollars they can waste on projects because, like I said, they've got the largest natural gas field in the world, and natural gas on a day like today is a great, is a great thing. So Qatar has this little program going called the 10,000 Imam Program. They want to retrain 10,000 imams around the world. They are doing this in 70 different 
countries, and it's a multi-billion dollar project being run through something called Eid Charity, started, <laughs> co-founded by a guy, and I'm not making this up, the guy who co-founded Eid Charity is the same guy who started the Qatar Football Association that's bringing the World Cup to Qatar. However, if you go to Washington, D.C., they call him a specially designated terrorist because he's the guy funding ISIS, funding El Nusra, and was previously funding Al Qaeda. Um, so interesting kind of guy, that's what Qatar is really on about. Qatar right now is also home to Hamas. If you're the leader of Hamas or you're one of the big wigs in Hamas, do you really want to live in Gaza? I mean, seriously, nothing personal to anybody, but Gaza's a bit of a dump. Um, so the leadership of Hamas doesn't want to live in a dump, so they all live up in Qatar in five-star hotels. The leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, or the inspirational cleric of the Muslim Brotherhood, lives in Qatar. Why? Because it's a great place if you're one of those guys. So this is kind of... Uh, this is kind of one of the problems. So let's bring this back around to why you're here, Kashmir. Qatar is pumping huge amounts of money into Pakistan. It's their biggest single project where they're trying to retrain imams, put money into Islamic universities, put money into schools. Guess which one's next? India. You would think India would say, oh no, you know, not doing that. And it's like, oh yeah, they are. Huge amounts of money going into India. A uh, large amount of money going into Sri Lanka. Uh, as you may recall, they just blew up a bunch of Christian churches there a while ago. Yeah, those guys. Uh, and some of the money goes into Bangladesh. Not a lot, but some of it's going into Bangladesh. So when you look at the problem in Kashmir right now, you have a problem with a rising Islamist extremism, which is going back to many of the violent ways, and it's pushing itself in that direction. And these are the same people who say, we need to get Kashmir, and then we go to Delhi. So the future of Kashmir is just one tiny part of a much larger global struggle. Uh, that global struggle against Islamists, against the political Islam, against the Muslim Brotherhood, against Jama Islamiya, that global struggle is gonna go on, in my view, it's a generational struggle. It's not something that's gonna be solved tomorrow or next week. Uh, this is something your children will be dealing with. Um, this all sounds rather pessimistic, doesn't it? Um, there are a few bright lights in this, and the bright lights in this are, one, at the center of much of this lies the government of Iran, which hopefully won't survive that much longer. Behind Iran lies the money in Qatar, and hopefully the Altani family will maybe even be overthrown by their own people, because they're taking billions of dollars and throwing it into Syria and India and Pakistan instead of throwing it into Qatar. Uh, then there's India itself, where I think as an outsider, I've been there a few times, but as an outsider, I think there's an awakening in, in India that says, we better get our act together here and start trying to figure out where we're going, because if not, we're gonna be in real trouble, much like Pakistan, much like Bangladesh, much like Afghanistan. So there is a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but let me just say one other thing. Before, 2011, before 2001, when terrorism became a popular subject, I actually testified to the Canadian Senate in 1998 and said, and I remember one of the things I talked about was money. If you want certain problems to go away, like, I don't know, extremism and terrorism, take the money away, follow the money, kill the money. I testified at the Air India Inquiry and said the same thing to Mr. Justice Major. If you want to stop this problem, take the money away. So the message you need to send to the government of Canada, for instance, would be to quit funding terrorism, seriously. Registered charities in Canada are still funding terrorism. The government of Canada just put $160 million into UNRWA, which is basically Hamas, because UNRWA has been taken over to Hamas. So the government of Canada just gave $160 million to Hamas. And the message has to go to these guys, quit doing it. So, I know Kashmir looks pretty bleak right now, and I think it's going to be a problem for a while, but there are a few bright lights out there. There's a few things to look at that might be a bit more positive in the future, but for now, it's going to be a difficult time. But go after the politicians, tell them to cut the money, follow the money. You stop the money, a lot of the problems will go away. Anyway, I could go on forever, but I'll stop here and we'll move on. Thank you very much for inviting me.
Sai is a Canadian broadcaster, editor, publisher, and writer of fiction and non-fiction. He's a campaigner against the dangers of political Islam and Muslim Brotherhood. He's the recipient of Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for his service in Canada. He also is the founder of Canadian Thinkers Forum and Progressive Muslims Institute Canada and Muslim Committee Against Anti-Semitism. A huge round of applause for Tahir Ji. Thank you very much, Varna Ji. And uh, with, the, uh, with due permission, uh, Rajeev Malhotra, he is my guru. Uh, before uh, talking about the Kashmir issue, I like to address Islamophobia issue in two, three lines. Uh, when a uh, member parliament, Ikra Khaled, tabled uh, um, M103 motion against uh, uh, quote unquote Islamophobia, I wrote her an email and asked her that if there would had been a Islamophobia in Canada, more than 10 member parliamentarians of Muslim origin would have not been elected in Canada. I never got her reply back. <laughs> I understand that with the passage of time, we can see a uh, few uh, streaks of Islamophobia, but that's the kind of uh, business for Islamist organizations. Uh, they want that Islamophobia happen so that they could make more and more money. On contrary, there is a huge Hindu phobia. And we witnessed that Hindu phobia last August after uh, Article 370 abrogation, when five, four Canadian member parliament, parliamentarians and one senator, they all showed up in Pakistan consulate here in Toronto to show their solidarity with Islamists mm -hmm. and to condemn Hindu Kashmiris. So five Canadian member parliamentarians showed their... Including Indians. <coughs> yes. Yeah. And including conservative senator. My conservative uh, MP friend just left. Otherwise, I would have shared with him. And TAG TV do have videos of those uh, hatred message. So this is the kind of a scenario. Now let me introduce myself just in one line. I'm a Hindu born in Muslim faith. If this truth would have been a part of every Bharti Kashmiri Muslim, Kashmiri Hindus would have not gone through that horrible and terrible exodus. But Pakistan sponsored terrorism in Kashmir, forced to leave Hindu Kashmiris their homeland. Keeping this reality in mind, I started inviting Kashmiri Hindus to my TV show. You remember, sir, for the past 10 years, so that we could hear their stories. Tag TV took a lead to tell the world about miseries of Hindu Kashmiris in the wake of Pakistani Islamist militant Islamism, uh, terrorism. Today, there is a hope for Hindu Kashmiris after abrogation of Article 370 and 35A that they might go back to their homeland. But the scar of terrorism in Kashmir is unforgettable. I must say all those Pakistani militant forces and Pakistani establishment, they all must apologize to Kashmiri Hindus and humanity for what they had done in Kashmir. <laughs> but in reality, this is not going to happen. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan and country's army janta with their terrorist wings such as lashkar e taiba jamaatul dawa united jihad council harkatul mujahideen hizbul mujahideen jaish e mohammad harkatul jihadi islami 
لشکر عمر لشکر جنگوی لشکر اسلام سپاہ محمد سپاہ صحابہ حزب التحریر اسلام مجاہدین جیش اسلام اسلامک جہاد یونین تحریک طالبان پاکستان اینڈ حقانی نیٹ ورک دا لسٹ گوز آن گوز دے آر ناٹ گوئنگ ٹو اسٹاپ دس جہاد دس از اے ریالٹی As today's event flyer stated very clearly that, quote, it has been 30 years since the Kashmiri Hindus were hounded from their homes after thousands perished due to terror unleashed on them by radical Islamists, backed by Pakistan through mass murders, rapes, torture, arson, looting, and fear-mongering. Kashmiri Hindus became refugees in their own land and were left to perish by successive regimes in India and world order at large." Unquote. Today is their Holocaust day, when they had to leave their ancestral homes in Kashmir. Today, as we are commemorating their 30 years of exile, India's BJP government passed a historic bull bill in order to offer refuge to persecuted minorities, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, Buddhists, Jain, and Parsi from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan. Pakistan somehow managed to provoke extreme left and Muslim protesters against this bill in India. Pakistan was carved out of India on false notion of two-nation theory in 1947. This two-nation theory claimed to distinct and separate Muslims and Hindus of subcontinent, resulting a new carved-out country known as Pakistan. That two-nation theory aims to cut me into two pieces, as I personally call myself a Hindu born in Muslim faith. But this two-nation theory proved wrong in 1947 when almost same number of Muslims preferred staying in India rather than moving to Pakistan. Also major Muslim leaders at the time opposed two-nation theory and the creation of Pakistan as well. Two-nation theory again proved wrong in 1971 when Bengali Muslims decided to separate their country Bangladesh from Pakistan due to mass murders of Bengalis in the hand of Pakistan army. Similarly, Baloch separatists are fighting with Pakistan state for a long to seek their independence since they claim that Pakistan annexed Balochistan by violating international laws. Such are not hidden facts. Thousand articles and books by even progressive Pakistanis have been written in Pakistan and abroad, revealing those historic facts. But Pakistan's state machinery, their self-claimed patriotic media, and writers, journalists trained in that particular mindset deny all those facts. Eventually, ordinary men and women of Pakistani origin deny those facts too. Kashmir is the most top agenda of Pakistan army and Pakistan's diplomat offices, including Canada. Sadly, Kashmiri issue is being used here in Canada by Pakistani establishment too. By the way, I wrote an, uh, actually a couple of emails to Senator Salma Tawla Jan, to uh, MP Ikra Khalid, that how come you being a uh, senator, Canadian senator, a Canadian member parliamentarian, meet jihadi Kashmiri militant in Canada because you are representing my beautiful country Canada not Pakistan here. Good. Another issue in Pakistan is about human rights abuses with minorities particularly forced conversion and marriages of Hindu, Sikh and Christian girls in Pakistan. India, on the other hand, is an emerging economic power. Prime Minister Modi's much-needed Hindu heritage revival in recent years pointed towards a clear direction of India's future. Indians have clearly given the mandate to BJP 
to set the future of India under Prime Minister Modi's vision. BJP mandate reveals the majority of Indians' aspirations to stand on their identity rather than being called politically secularist. Secularist politics in India means politics of accommodating minorities, especially Muslims, who are little less than 200 million there. If that huge number integrates in the society rather than sticking to their ghettos, they can change their fate. Also, they wouldn't be needed to be accommodated in India. They would be owning India. Hindus are absolutely tolerant to other cultures and religions. It is up to other cultures and religions to intermingle with their host traditions. Multiculturalism and interfaith are not one-way traffic. Every culture and religion has to go along with each other. So in this new phase of India, Muslims particularly needed to get assimilated in the society for their own development. Indians hope that BJP government would better respond to Pakistan, which has unfortunately become a harboring center of terrorism. Although it's first time that India is not bending over Pakistan's terrorist bullies. So we do have a strong hope that current Indian regime would tackle Pakistan's terrorism as well as make Hindu Kashmiris return possible to their homeland. Thank you. Very much. May I now request our next speaker, Dr. Jagmohan Sangha, to speak a few words. Dr. Jagmohan. Dr. Jagmohan Sangha holds a PhD in management apart from a law degree and a master's degree in English literature and an MBA. He's a writer and a filmmaker and is a lawyer by profession. A huge round of applause for Dr. Sangha. Uh, I would uh, start uh, today's uh, session by a quote by Martin Luther King. He said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. What can be bigger injustice than uprooting someone from the place of residence in an unceremonial, inhuman, and brutal manner? And this is exactly what happened to hundreds and thousands of Kashmiris in 1990. What happened was not only barbaric, it was shame for humanity, as thousands of innocent men, women, boys, and girls were subjected to mental and physical torture, which you are well aware of. Let me tell you a small anecdote. A friend of mine, after living in Canada for about six months, had to renounce uh, his PR for some personal reasons, and he goes back to his own country. Uh, several years later, he tries to come back to Canada, and he was not allowed to enter, which included his visit visa as well. Trust me, he went into depression. The very thought that he will never be able to see the place where he lived just for a few months pushed him into severe depression. This, when he had no property, no family, no childhood memories attached to the place where he did not suffer any human violation either. So I can imagine the plight of so many Kashmiris. We can imagine the helplessness, the mental trauma of hundreds and thousands of Kashmiris Hindus who could not go back to where they spent all their lives. And many of you are present in this hall today. When I was writing this, uh, two of uh, my, uh, one of my poems came to, two lines came to my mind, and I'll recite it for you. Ab vahaan par mere kadmo ke nishan tak nahi hai. Ab vahaan par mere kadmo ke nishan tak nahi hai. Jis shahar ki galiyo mein zindagi guzar di mene. It's, thanks. It's ironical that the genocides like what happened to Sikhs in 1984 and what happened to Kashmiri Hindus in 1990 has never caught attention of masses as it should have. 
Not many people realize what is it like to be a displaced person. No one realizes what is it like to live in tents, to marry your daughter off, even to some match which is, not com in, uh, which is absolutely incompatible, just because you are living in a makeshift camp and want to safeguard your child's life. Youngsters taking to smoking and alcohol, and elderly getting into mood and anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, personality disorders, and so on. Even Acharya Jinzi mentioned, no one knows, so no one cares. It's so very important that all these things should be made known to the world, not confining only to Kashmiris, Kashmiri Hindus. Talking of trauma, it reminds me of my grandmother. My grandfather, an army officer in British Army, was killed by a mob during partition of India and Pakistan. She lived over 35 years thereafter, and trust me, there won't be a single day when she, she did not curse people of a particular community, who she always thought were responsible for killing her husband. Having said that, every Muslim is not a terrorist, every Muslim is not bad, every Muslim was not bad in 1947, and every Muslim is not bad today. When Kashmiri Hindus were displaced, not only did they lose and risk their assets and depletion of human and social capital, but it also became worse when they had to witness the killings of the family members. And many, in, in many cases, even subjected to rape and torture. If this was not well-planned act of ethnic cleansing, then what was it? I was trying to gather some uh, primary data, and I was talking to a lawyer friend of mine, and when she was telling me things about uh, Hindu Kashmiri's plight in Kashmir in 1990, her voice would choke very often because no one notices the invisible trauma and for people who were not affected, everything goes unrecognized and unacknowledged. And it happened in a country which is supposed to be multicultural, liberal and secular democracy. All this only for one fault of Kashmiri Hindus. And what was that fault? Their religion your religion. And ironically, freedom of religion is fundamental right as per Article 25 and 28 of Constitution of India. Here were Hindus who spoke Kashmiri, all of you. The same language as people who made them leave the valley. Here were Hindus who were made or encouraged to study only Hindi instead of Urdu so that they do not get positions in the government, where Urdu was a prerequisite. Here were Hindus who, even if, not, uh, even if they got government jobs, were escorted to offices and back by army or police whenever the government seat was in Srinagar during summer months, despite massacre of this magnitude. Apart from Kashmiri Hindus, how many people are really, really aware that hardly any cases have been registered in the valley, perhaps nil. Same happened even in case of 1984 genocide with Sikhs. It took forever to register a few cases. We all understand that terrorism has no religion whatsoever. And this evening, it is not my intention at all to malign a particular religion or community. But it's also very, very essential that our voice is raised against atrocities and it should be heard. We should mince no words to pin down those who are responsible for any kind of terrorism. We need to analyze the unpleasant episodes and happenings of the last about half a century in India in the right perspective. We also need to look into the historical perspective and atrocities and the mindset of people involved as well as psychological trauma, the displaced people had to undergo in India, which was faced by Kashmiris and Sikhs, etc. If you see the historical perspective, which I would like to mention because I saw some youngsters uh, in the hall, Kashmiri Hindus have gone through a lot over the centuries. That, in my opinion, made them very subdued and resilient as well. 
which is good, but we do see the elements of sacrifice for the last several centuries. And what's one such example was sacrifice of Guru Tegh Bahadur. His martyrdom and supreme sacrifice have significant importance in the evolution of Indian Athos, especially in the history of Kashmiri Pandits. As it can be perceived, the triumph of the eternal glory of the spiritual traditions in India. Ninth Guru of Six, Guru Tegh Bahadur, attained martyrdom at Chandni Chowk, Delhi in November 1675. Imagine what happened 320 years later or 315 years later in 1990. Let's go back a little bit in history. Mughals ruled almost for, uh, I believe, 200 years. I'm referring to various dynasties like Khilji dynasty, Tughlaq, Sayyids, and of course Lodi dynasty, etc. Each of them was different in their outlook as compared to the other. What, when Akbar conquered Kashmir back in 1586-87, he gave reasonable freedom to Kashmiris. And due to exceptional intelligence of Kashmiri Hindus, I think he was the one who coined the term Pandit. During that period, Hindus not only enjoyed social security, they were also given high posts. And then came Aurangzeb. Now, during Aurangzeb's time, as we all know, he was very, very eager that Hindus adopt Islam. It was primarily Brahmins who preserved the Hindu religion at that point in time, and their conversion to Islam would have helped him in bringing the rest of the Hindus in Muslim fold. Obviously, he targeted Brahmins first because they formed the core of the Hindu religion. When there was resistance, he started persecuting them. Kashmiri Pandits were renowned for their learning and orthodoxy and gave stiff resistance to Aurangzeb's policies. Since Aurangzeb wanted to create a Muslim theocracy, he banned Hindus from celebrating festivals like Holi and Diwali, etc. In fact, he issued a fatwa for doing so, for banning such festivals, and the fatwa was known as Fatwai Alamgiri, which perhaps many of you are aware of. Around the same time, a lot of Hindus' temples were demolished as well. During the rule of about half a century, Aurangzeb had so many governors. And one notorious governor was Iftikhar Khan, and he was the biggest fanatic out of them. He was using force ruthlessly to convert pandits to Islam, and that time many of Kashmiri pandits had to flee Kashmir. Guru Tegh Bahadur Nagar, he became the source of spiritual solace, if I can say so, at that point in time, because people were suffering, and they saw in him their protector against tyranny, that is why the Kashmiri Pandits felt that he could help them and protect them from tyrannical rule of Aurangzeb. Many of the Brahmins who did not accept Islam under the threat of uh, death managed to escape Kashmir and also under the guidance of one Hindu noble person by the name of Kirparam reached Guru Tegh Bahadur at that point in time. That was back in 1675. As you all know, his ultimate sacrifice brought tremendous change in the body politics of India. But it's so very painful that there were several Aurangzebs in the streets of Kashmir in 1990. I always feel that sometimes it's so very important to show your muscle power. Lest people take, this is what Mr. Malhotra said as well the Kshatriya part of it. You may be a saint, but it's very, very important to become a soldier as well. And sometimes people do not understand your decency and meekness. They rather take it as weakness. Over three centuries later, exodus of Kashmiri Pandits from Kashmir in 1990 over seventh such exodus since the arrival of Islam in Kashmir in the 14th century, we are all aware that obtrusive and perfunctory attitude of administration toward the displaced Kashmiri Pandits made their post-exodus existence even more miserable. 
For long, the voice of Kashmiri Hindus was not heard, and people remained indifferent to their plight. As I said earlier, this was another shameful and horrific incident in the history of India. Everyone understands the fact that terrorism has no religion, but at the same time, terrorism should not be tolerated nor justified whatever the motive or purpose. Before I conclude, I want to quote Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said, this world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. I urge the intelligentsia to learn from what happened in Kashmir 30 years back and work towards making this world beautiful. This can be accomplished by reducing vulnerabilities, put best efforts to take effective and collective action to support displaced people. Above all, to ensure that voices are raised without fear so that this kind of genocide never ever happens again. Then only the world can become a better place for our next generation to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sangha. Moving on, may I now invite uh, Sri Vidya Bhushmiri Hindu, who has witnessed the night of January 19th, 1990. He's a trained IT professional, a writer, a TV host, and a social activist. May we have uh, Vidya Ji on stage. Sisters and brothers present here, Vidya Bhushandar, a proud Indian, a Kashmiri Hindu by birth, and a Canadian by karma, welcomes you all here. Today we are gathered here to remember the genocide of my small, peace-loving community, also called Kashmiri Pandits, from the heaven on earth called Kashmir, at the hands of radical Wahhabi Islam, 30 winters ago. And the yearning to go back is increasing with every passing day. And we can see the light at the end of the tunnel after Article 370 and 35A was abrogated. I would like to thank the management of this August Indo-Japan Samurai Center and its preserver, Acharya Zanjinio, for giving me this opportunity to share with you and the civilized world at large the story of our genocide. I would like to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart who are present here and all those who are watching us online unfolding the heart-wrenching tale of the genocide of Kashmiri Hindus at the hands of militant Islam from the day it landed in my peaceful vale called Kashmir. We were slowly marginalized and eventually became refugees in our own country, India. Our genocide is different. There are Jews present here, they know what genocide is. But our genocide is different. It's not just a genocide, but it's a continuous genocide since last 600 years at the hands of an ideology which is militant in nature and believes in annihilation of all those who do not believe in theirs. Kashmir has been regarded as the fountainhead of Indian civilization since my ancestors, the Saptrishis or the seven sages put together the first book of mankind ever wrote, the Rig Veda. This fabled land of seers, sages, scholars of different fields of sciences and arts, spiritual leaders and healers have inherited and interacted with the East and West for thousands of years. We exported teachers rather than weapons or warriors all over the world. And this created deep and enduring relationship with the rest of the world for thousands of years. The richness of Indian culture is manifested in myriad traditions, languages, faith and rituals that lend it both wealth and depth. People of this revered land exude a sense of vitality and positive energy that conveys the essence of life. India never invaded any country in the last 10,000 years of recorded history. When many cultures were only nomadic forest dwellers over 5,000 years ago, India established Harappan culture in Sindhu Valley. The principal values that represent the Indian ethic system since the days of Ramayana are Thyaga, or the renunciation, Dhana, the liberal giving, Nishta, the dedication, Satya, the truth, Ahimsa, the nonviolence, and Upeksha, the forbearance. India has em embraced anybody and everybody, be it the Prophet Muhammad's family or the people from Iran who were subjugated and forced to flee that land, or was it the 500 women and children of Polish origin in, during the Second World War by Maharaja Vijay Singh of Jamnagar, my birthplace of Kashmir. My birthplace Kashmir was a Hindu kingdom following the tenements of Sanatan Dharma, the universal religion which finds its roots in ancient Vedas. 
and Puranas. And one such Purana is Nilmat Puran, the most ancient Purana in the history of mankind. And you will be surprised, ladies and gentlemen here, that the first immigration policy is doctrined in that Nilmat Purana. It talks about refugee asylum. It talks about that anybody who comes as a Sharnagati, who comes as a refuge, without looking at his caste, color, creed, sex, you should give them refuge. But they have to respect the law of the land. And this is what Raja Sahidev did in the 13th century, when he granted asylum to the followers of Islam, Shahmir and his family. And within a short span of time, Shahmir and his coterie usurped the kingdom through palace intrigues and deceit and established the first Islamic regime, which lasted for nearly 500 years till the year 1819, when Kashmir was liberated by the Sikh ruler Maharaja Ranjit Singh's forces, thus ending the barbaric Islamic rule of more than 480 years in the valley of Kashmir. The five century rule by various Muslim rulers decimated and annihilated a highly learned, peaceful, creative, and enlightened race through forced conversions to Islam, loot, plunder, desecration of places of worship, rape, terror, and mass mayhem. In the year 1990, half a million Kashmiri Hindus were forced to flee that Kashmir, which was the land of their ancestors for the last 5,000 years. The orgy of violence perpetrated on them had left them with no choice. The, their choice was clearly being conveyed on public address systems, on the pulpits of various mosques around the city of Kashmir, around the city of Srinagar, and various cities across Kashmir. They were just given three choices. Relive, salyav, ya galyav. Which means either you become Muslims, you embrace Islam, and then you can enjoy the bounties of Kashmir and the Islamic world. Or you just flee the land, or we will kill you. Sadly, the perpetrators were not only Pakistanis, but the Muslims in the valley, our own neighbors, with whom we studied, we played cricket, enjoyed the same films, and spent a lot of time with them. And they overnight found a kafir and a mukfir in us. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a time when the Islamic barbarism reached its peak under the law of Islam, under the uh, ruler Skandar, also called iconoclast or the Buddh chicken, only 11 families were left in the valley of Kashmir who were living in exile. They were living in caves and forests just to save their dharma and their lives. Rest all fleed the land or converted into Islam. Well, that's a gory chapter of history, the medieval times. But what happened in 1990 was more shameful. I became a refugee in my own land. I'm a Kashmiri Hindu whose history dates back to pre-Vedic era for over 6,000 years. Me and my ancestors were decimated by radical Islamic ideologue ever since it set its foot on my land 680 years back. Genocide was inflicted on us and we were ousted from our land not once, not twice, but ladies and gentlemen, we were ousted and forcedly to leave the land for seven times. The unified and sometimes reassuring political slogan of long live Hindu Muslim security had suddenly disappeared from the political parallels of the Muslim crowds, seeming to give away, to go by by their rational patterns of conduct as components of civilized life, making bonfires of tires at night, ensuring by coercion that participation of Hindu kafirs, all a dramatic blend of frenzy, ignorance, fantasy, and naivety tinged green by the footlights of Islam. The new slogans, being mouthed with zooming zest, presented amazingly myopic content, declaring war against the Hindus, threatening them with death and destruction, allowing them to know way just to flee, frightening them to quit and buzz off, stressing the established establishment of the Prophet's governance or Nizam and Mustafa, and exposing low levels of cultural achievement. There were so many slogans, and some of them were blood curling. Kashmir mein rehna hai, to Allah Akbar kehna hai. If you choose to live in Kashmir, so you will have to say Allah Akbar. I would like to tell the young generation, you think that the 90 uprising in Kashmir was a liberal-minded so-called Kashmiriyat. No, dear friends, it was not. It was backed by radical Islam. It was backed by so many terrorist organizations, as Tahir Bhai said. There were like more than 50 organizations who took up guns against the very hapless Hindus. As you can see, Pakistan, Bataur, Ustu, Patne, Usan, 19 January 1990 is a night which is etched in my mind. It gives me goosebumps when I saw the, f the faces of my mother and sisters. They were in high school. My dad and me, we were watching a Friday night film and the, the volume was probably loud. And my mom came down from the uh, first floor saying that, did you hear what's happening outside? 
I mean, we, we said, no, we didn't hear anything outside. So we peeped from the windows, tens of thousands of Kashmiri Muslims with mashals, those torch lights were in their hands and they were raising slogans. And the slogan which broke the last back of Kashmiriyat was that Asigasi Pakistan, which technically means that we want to make this land of Kashmir into Pakistan without Kashmiri Hindus, males and their women, their daughters and their sisters. This broke the fabric of that land, which was still somewhere there. What we call the Kashmiriyat absolutely got shattered that very night. And the exodus of the Hindus started the very next day. More than 500,000 Hindus had to flee their homes in the valley and lived as refugees in their other parts of the country. They became refugees in their own land. The cold, dark night of January 1990 has stirred into life the worst nightmares of Kashmiri Hindus living in the valley. Screaming from loudspeakers, as I said, they gave us no option but to flee. The threat has been coming for a long time. But the world remained silent then. We were not in the world of social media. We were not in the world of so much of information on our fingertips. So what you can do who are present here? The, the so-called civilized world remained silent then, but not anymore. So what I would like to all of you present here, when you go back, what you can do for us? Local, state and national governments, they fail to protect Kashmiri Hindus and fundamental rights of so-called Hindu, Hindu nation. Leadership, leading international human rights organizations, they fail Kashmiri Hindus by ignoring their political, economic and cultural gen genocide. We want your voice to be taken so that all those deaf ears will know that how a peaceful community was hounded from their home of 5,000 years. National and international media aided and abetted the genocide by totally ignoring it. Even today we hear so many stories which are basically whitewashing that incident. And even when we talk about the, very, the newest film, probably the first one of its kind, which showed how Kashmiri Hindus were hounded from their own land. And we can see hate messages coming. Oh, we should forget the past. Really? We should forget the past? Then if you forget the past, then why did you start all this which was happening for the last seven centuries? National and international filmmakers, as I said, ignored our genocide story. But thanks to some of the great filmmakers like Vindu Vinod Chopra and Vivek Agnihotri, who are bringing our stories to the masses. Now, how can you present here, or those who are watching me live, help me as a Kashmiri Hindu to return back to my ancestral home? By breaking the silence and speaking out against global terrorism. And when you see here, when in your home, slowly creeping on in our own backdrop. As Tom said, that we are seeing in this, the most peaceful country in the world, we are seeing that radical Islam, that radical terrorizing of people coming back to this land and going to hound us. We don't know whether we, go, we are going to have another Kashmir in the next 20 or 30 years here. What you can do is, you can engage media and forcing them to focus on our story by forcing policymakers to enact and implement legislations against global terrorists and countries that harbor these terrorists by engaging human rights organizations and making them aware of our cultural and physical genocide, by, ra by raising and donating funds that will go towards the preservation of Kashmiri Hindus, their culture and heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, we still have over 100,000 souls. These were those hapless people who were not probably that much educated. These were the people who owned orchards. They owned cultivable land. They owned, uh, you know, um, dairy animals. They had to leave everything behind. They couldn't bring any of those immovable properties with them. They are the ones who are languishing in so many camps even today. If you look at the Jagti camps, and so there are so many of them in Jammu and other parts of the country. They live on doles, doled by the governments. They, they live on the rations provided by the governments. We want them to feel secure. They want, we, want, we want them to know that there is a chance that we will go back to our land. I'm living in Canada along with hundreds of other KP families. And we have achieved everything that, um, that's mundane. But I'm slowly losing my identity, my language, my culture, and my roots. And this is what we all present here are looking for. And we will go back soon one day. Thank you.